Becoming a magician takes thousands of hours, right, Ashley? Oh, I'm not a magician. I'm a design specialist at the Container Store. But you transform closets and pantries. Well, I turn your most frustrating spaces into ones you love. With a magic wand? Uh, with Alpha, our customizable, adjustable, and affordable shelving and drawer system. The amazing Ashley, making daily frustration disappear. <laughs> Just doing my job. Transform your space with Alpha and save 20% on purchases over $500. Get started with your free design at the Container Store today. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. It's my music. You're listening to Music of the Mat on the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Hello and welcome to Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. It's all part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. I'm your host, Andrew Rich. This is episode 125 and it is a taste of 2021. And today I'm joined by a first time guest here on the show. He is a contributor to Voices of Wrestling. It's Gerard DeTrolio. Hello, Gerard. Hey, Andrew, thanks for having me on. I'm full of food, but ready to talk some wrestling music. <laughs> good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're here. Definitely making your debut on the show. Um, now, for those that may not know you, Gerard, uh, you are mainly our resident All Japan reviewer on the website. Uh, you've done other stuff here and there, too, of course, but All Japan is your bread and butter. Uh, you and Paul Volsch, basically. And you guys both do yeoman's work covering that stuff, which is the beauty of VOW, where if you have the passion to cover something that you want to cover, they'll let you do it. And I know All Japan is uh, not the not the easiest to cover lately, uh, given to Jiri's booking and guys like Nomura leaving and all that, but you still do a great job with it, Gerard, that's for sure. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a labor of love. And uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is, like, I started watching All Japan in late 1999, so... I've been through a lot, so that doesn't mean that I don't like, I'm like not ever frustrated or anything, but at this point I've put in too much of my life to following the promotion. So I can't really, you know, turn back at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to get into all Japan 99 is the best year to do it. Cause you know, it's right after the peak of the four pillars run, you know, right when all the guys are leaving for Noah, like that's great timing on your part there, Gerard, I think so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, since this is your first time on the show here, uh, let me ask you this, Gerard. When did you become a wrestling fan just in general? How'd you get into it? Uh, well, so that's like a sort of a, a two-stage process because I would have watched like wrestling in, in around 91, 92 on like Sunday afternoons uh, with my uh, grandfather before the, your uh, stereotypical Sunday Italian meal. Uh, that's when it aired in uh, like Eastern Canada. Uh, like the big uh, WWF show. So I watched that. Like, I remember, you know, Bret Hart is the Intercontinental Champion. I remember um, uh, Undertaker uh, vomiting because of Papa Shango. Uh, but for whatever reason, um, I fell off and I actually sort of didn't watch at all. I, I was sort of aware of what was going on. Like I read a lot of um, video game magazines when I was a kid. So I, I like, it was like, you know, certain faces were familiar to me. Uh, but then I guess uh, all of a sudden in, I guess, late 1998, early 1999, like everyone on the the playground at school was wearing uh, like NWO shirts and stuff like that. Uh, so I got back into it, I guess, a little later during the peak than some people, because I think the first Raw I ever watched was the one after uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre in February 1999. That was the one with uh, Paul White. Yep. Big show just yep. debuted. Yeah, he debuted the night before. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, um, it was the Ultimate Warrior who puked because of Papa Shango, not Undertaker. So, oh, did I say Undertaker? Oops. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, uh, it was Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what about uh, music? Has that played a big part in your fandom at all? Uh, I would say so. Yeah. Like I remember, even back in like the early two thousands, if you looked hard enough, you could get MP threes of all of the uh, big Japanese themes. And so those were on my, I guess, whatever uh, MP3 player I would have had. That was even before uh, iPods. I, I had like, I can't even remember what company made them. I had like little portable MP3 players and I would just fill it for full of Japanese themes. 
Cool, cool. Well, uh, today, Gerard, we are doing a taste of 2021. It's our annual year-end episode, and um, I know it's cliche to say this, but uh, this year, it, it did fly by to me in a lot of ways. I can't believe it's already over, really. And I think the key to that is, you know, by comparison, 2020 just never seemed to end. It was just a nightmare world that just kept going on forever. And this year, don't get me wrong, still a nightmare world in a lot of ways, <laughs> that's for sure. But I think what helped was that there were more bright spots this year that could get our spirits up, you know, with crowds coming back to shows in America and AEW going on a hot run and CM Punk returning to wrestling after seven years away and Brian Danielson and Adam Cole jumping to AEW and Hangman Page winning the title and all the forbidden door stuff between companies and New Japan Strong getting crowds. Like, there's been some genuine happiness and good news and smiles this year, Gerard, which I think after last year, we all needed. Absolutely, yeah. I think that the sort of return to relative, well, normalcy, I'll say, at least in North America, sort of helped move things along faster for, compared to 2020, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me personally, just going to All Out and being part of that experience with the other VOW people there, that was one of the best nights of my life, period. And I didn't think six, eight months, a year prior that I would have been able to go at all, really. But thankfully, with the vaccines, I was able to go. And same with Dynamite in Boston. Like, you know, memories and moments like that, you have to cling to and cherish them even more so, I think, nowadays. Because there is the other side of things. You know, one of the biggest stories of the year is Ring of Honor. As we know it, shutting down. And a lot of people losing their jobs and their contracts because of it. I mean, that's a, a major part of the wrestling ecosystem just going away pretty much. And a lot of people in WWE got fired as well this year, despite, you know, record profits in the company. They got fired because of, of quote-unquote budget cuts. So things are very much still dicey in a lot of ways, Gerard. Yeah, I mean, I was had my eye on going to like a local indie show in February, but I don't even know if that's going to happen. But like, I really want to get to see some live wrestling soon because it's been oh i think since spring 99 or 2019 i should say sorry <laughs> then uh, that i've been to a show actually we'll talk about uh, one of those shows uh, later that i went to because it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about oh well i'll keep that in mind then <laughs> yeah a little preview for you cool yeah but um i want to bring up one more thing here which is japan i think that same sense of bright spots among the the doom and gloom is is prevalent there too because you know, right now they're still doing the club crowds and not full arenas, which has just become a real slog to get through. But at the same time, I think there's still a lot of quality wrestling going on in Japan, whether it's New Japan, All Japan, NOAA, Dragon Gate, DDT. Like I told this to Damon a few episodes ago, but I look at my spreadsheet for matches this year and, you know, New Japan is up and down the whole thing with many Match of the Year contenders. You know, All Japan is on there. Dragon Gate is on there. DDT, Noah, they're all, they're all on there. It's just the COVID atmosphere is still putting this big dark cloud over everything. So again, we have to appreciate this stuff as best we can, Gerard. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a shame. But like at this point, you know, even the smallest victories mean a lot more than they would. Definitely, definitely. Well, in any event, uh, let's get to the episode proper here. Uh, we are going to look at 10 themes that debuted in wrestling during the year. And it's called A Taste of 2021 because it's not a top 10 list. It's not covering every single thing that debuted this year. It's just a taste. And some of it tastes good. Some of it tastes eh, not so good. But that's the point of the show here. And like every year, there are songs I wanted to get, but I couldn't because they're not available yet. Like Jake Lee's new theme, couldn't get that one, not available. Uh, Starlight Kid's new theme, not available yet either. So I had to scrap those. Or, in the case of AEW, there were too many choices to make. Like, God bless Mikey Ruckus, but he just put out so many songs this year, and I can't pick all of them. So, I had to make some choices here. So, if you're wondering, hey, where is Adam Cole's theme, or FTR's theme, or Ruby Soho, or Hook? Like, they're all coming, I promise you. I'll get to them all soon. Just be patient, please. Because we could do all AEW themes here, Gerard, but it wouldn't be fair, I don't think. Well, no, uh, variety is the spice of life, and, and variety is what sort of keeps me keep watching wrestling. Um, like, if I didn't 
watch a lot of different wrestling, I think I, I would go crazy. It really sort of allows me to like stay a fan and stay in love with like contemporary wrestling. Mm -hmm. And looking at the list here, there is a good amount of variety in terms of, of styles and genres. So we're good on that aspect for sure. We'll start off here with the first theme. Uh, this one is from WWE, and it's for the current WWE Universal Champion, the head of the table, the tribal chief himself, Roman Reigns. Roman finally got a new theme this year after forever, it seemed. It's by Def Rebel, and it's called Head of the Table. So in case you couldn't tell that Roman Reigns is supposed to be the biggest deal in WWE, well, here you go. You cannot get any more big deal than this song. You know, the opening alone with that bomb and the choirs, the hip-hop beats, the heavy bass drops, it's all quite epic. And it's funny to go back and compare it to his old theme, which they do sample in this one, and just how straightforward and simple that is. So even though it did take a while to change the theme here, I like the change, because it has that grandiosity that the Trouble Chief character is supposed to have, Gerard. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a tremendous theme and like one of the best things about uh, WWE in 2021. Uh, I don't watch a lot of uh, SmackDown at all, but if I'm sitting home on a Friday night and, you know, Roman's in the main event, I'll, I have turned on the show just to hear the theme. Mm -hmm. And the piano and orchestra are in there too. It reminds me of like a heavier version of the theme from the show Succession, which is all about power and fighting for control. And that ties into Roman being the head of the table and being in power as the champion and all that. It doesn't have like the snooty wealth overtones that the show has, or MJF's theme has for that matter. I think the heavier elements detract from that. But again, Roman's gimmick is not really about wealth. It's about power and dominance in general, Gerard. Yeah, I think uh, this... Roman arc, because best as I can tell, although I haven't been completely on top of it, is sort of an idea of that, you know, regardless of everything that you know could be said about his run, that he sort of, you know, did work for this, and he's not going to give it up. Right, right. And it's funny, the song is three minutes long, uh, which is still less time than it takes for Roman to do the entrance. <laughs> that, that thing takes a while, you know, just like everything else with Roman, the matches, the promos, the monologues, the storyline, everything is just, it's so drawn out. And I know recently they finally did some proper advancement with Roman beating up Heyman, but it's been a long 18 months of just Roman being on top and not much else, Gerard. Well, if, if you uh, are in the uh, VOW uh, universe, you would know that, uh, you know, the website and many of the contributors to it would have pointed out the, uh, uh, you know, the peak of Roman has already, you know, come and gone on this certain run. And now we're just, well, I know that things are moving forward now, but there was a long time of just spinning wheels and long entrances. Mm -hmm. Well, it would help too, if they were actually building someone up this whole time to finally beat him, but they really haven't. I mean, he's beaten everybody and there's no one on the roster full time who feels like the next guy, you know, someone like Brock Lesnar is a band aid. They need to build up future stars, but you know, WWE is, not really good at doing that these days, Gerard, I guess. No, and they're wasting the another Brock-Roman match just to sort of establish day one as a big pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. Going now from WWE to AEW, and it's for the current tag team champions there, the Lucha Brothers, Ray Phoenix and Penta L0M. I saw them win the belts live at All Out against the Bucks, and the best match I've ever seen live, I think. Uh, their new theme, it debuted this year. It's by Mikey Ruckus featuring Alex Abrahantes, their manager. It's called 
Zero Miedo. Se siente lo mejor es en el ring y eso es no miente, tú lo sientes, es bien fuerte, es todo pa' mi gente, oponentes caen con uh, uh, todo al frente, rey y los de lucha siempre están presentes, representando libertad y todos independientes, pelean con corazón y siempre están bien fuertes, castigos y movidos que siempre están calientes. So we talked about the glow up of Roman's old theme to his new one. This is another one here. I think the old Lucha Brothers theme, it, it just, it feels so tame and second rate to this one, which just goes balls to the wall. It's got bigger production, it's got choirs, it's got more energy. There's the great stinger. Tenemos cero miedo. I just, I enjoy this one a lot and Lucha Brothers are one of my favorite teams. So I'm glad they got this improved theme, Gerard. Yeah, I mean, I thought this was just like a really icon. I think this will become an iconic theme. And, you know, you're talking about you were being there at All Out, and that would have been incredible. But even just sitting at home watching it, I could see that entrance that they did is like probably one of the greatest wrestling entrances I've ever seen. Yeah, that was awesome for sure. And that's actually a different version than the one here, because this one, it's Alex doing the verses in Spanish. And you get, you get references, of course, Cerro Miedo, Animo, Zeros Up, M's Down. You also have your more generic lines too, which are translated here. Phoenix, Penta, make you feel the mood. They are the best in the ring, and that's not a lie. You can feel it. It is strong. It is for all the people. Opponents fall with bloop bloop, face first. They fight with heart, which is very strong. Punishing moves that are always hot. So it, it goes on from there. And that, I think, is another improvement on the old theme, where the old theme had one small verse and the chorus on repeat. This one has much more going on with it lyrically, Gerard. Yeah, and I mean, I think especially you have to give a shout out to Alex Abrahantes, who's a true jack of all trades. He's a wrestling manager, he's a salesman, and he's a musical artist. <laughs> yeah, I, I love how animated Alex is with everything. You know, he's just so excited about things. And at All Out, he was just going crazy the entire time, getting people fired up for the cage match and the Lucha Brothers and all that stuff. He he gets into it for sure. Um, same with the whole Penta says thing, which I like too. So yeah, he's a bit of a dork, sure. But I do find him endearing, Gerard. Yeah, I mean, he's got that energy of like a wrestling manager that's been sorely lacking for like quite a while in, in the business. Yeah, yeah. And we mentioned the live performance at All Out. Uh, that is available on its own to listen to um, on Spotify or whatever. So check that one out too. Um, and yeah, just, just being there live, it was so cool to see. Uh, certainly better than other live performances in AEW, <clears throat> Cody. <laughs> uh, that, that's for sure, Gerard. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's been some hits and misses uh, with some of those big AEW entrances. Definitely, but but this was a hit for sure. Oh, absolutely. Probably the best AEW entrance, I think. Over now to Japan for the Dragon Gate promotion. Uh, I just did a DG episode last time with Mike Spears, but... I saved one of their newer themes for the occasion. It's for Kaito Ishida. His new theme is by Kota Aoki from the band Cold Ride, who did his previous theme. This is called Never Stop Kicking. Yeah! Come on, make me more a cold by 
<laughs> so uh, we are three for three when it comes to building a new theme upon the previous one. Uh, she does old theme, Just a Kick Boy. They reused the melody and some of the lyrics from that one for this one, just in a different way. Uh, Kick Boy was, you know, fast-paced punk rock song, whereas this one is slower, it's groovier, more of a hip-hop influence, I think. And in general, it just sounds so much sleazier and more sinister and more more heel-leaning, especially with the tone of the vocals and whatnot. So it's cool that the same guy who made his old theme made his new one here. And I think in general, it's just a very good heel theme for a guy who loves to kick, Gerard. Yeah, I think it fits really well. And like you said, like I, you know, uh, being able to be a good kicker, that's something that definitely catches my attention in pro wrestling. And like I thought his matches, uh, I think it was last year with uh, Keisuke Okuda, were just awesome. So like it sort of really captured the uh, like the spirit of like what Ishida is. Yeah, for sure. And as far as the lyrics go, I did get a good laugh out of Google Translate from this one. I never stopped kicking. Do not you want to kick your ass. No rules, no limits. Ever and ever. Sewa, sewa. Let's shine light on me on stage. Give me the my, my, my microphone. On and on from bust to hips. Let's take away sexy children, fame and glory. So that's one of the more uh, eyebrow-raising Google Translates I've ever come across, I think. But <laughs> I, Well, I uh, think... So. Some of the earlier lyrics sort of make sense for uh, Ishida, but uh, yeah, it takes, a, it takes a weird turn there towards the end. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the kick imagery, that's all very straightforward and, and to the point, sure. Um, the sexy children, I don't know about that, but at least the overall message is on point, I think. Um, also, I remember he debuted this song when he challenged Shun Skywalker for the Dreamgate back in, I think, March which is a great spot to debut it in when it's a big title match like that and a great match to boot as well. And luckily they did put this out as a single a few months later instead of waiting for the album to come out. So uh, that's pretty cool too, Gerard. Yeah, I thought uh, that Skywalker versus Ishida match was awesome. And like, I don't watch a lot of Dragon Gate, but I watched the the big, uh, watched like a lot of the title matches in that. And that's one of the uh, best matches I thought that I've seen from them this year. And that is just the perfect place to debut a new theme. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah. Theme number four, and uh, we are going to go back to AEW. Uh, this time it's for Jamie Hayter. Jamie returned this year after a long absence away and aligned herself with Britt Baker. Her theme is again by Mikey Ruckus. This is called Indignation. <laughs> I know that uh, Alan Forel is a big fan of this one, and I don't blame him because it's quite the bop, as the kids say. It's your dubstep -y nightclub kind of song. Got a good beat to it, good for walking out to the ring. Has some oomph to it as well, has some menace, it's not too light. So I think it's a good theme for Jamie, who herself has this menace, that presence, and that power behind her, without it being the entire emphasis of the song, Gerard. Well, I mean, I think I might have a slightly different opinion. I think it's a good song on its own, but I think it's just, it just comes across to me as just a little too generic. I can see that. That's fair. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's not the kind of song that only works for Jamie and her alone. Like, it's more of just a type of song, really, and there are no specific lyrics for her either. So that's fair. That's fair. And I think, like, especially... You know, I'm not going to get into another debate about the AEW women's division, but I mean, Hater really stands out because I think of some like how her experience and her like refinement and all the time she spent in stardom is that she's such like a great talent for them. I would probably go with something a little more unique and stand out than this. 
Fair enough, fair enough, yeah, well. Well, how about this? I don't know if you felt this way too, but there's something about this song that just feels English to me. Like, it sounds like it's from the UK, even though it's not. Oh, if you were in a, I could see being in a club in London or something and this coming on or, you know, absolutely. Yeah, and I looked online on some Reddit threads and people there too were like, oh, this sounds so English. It's like a UK club scene song. And Jamie Hayter is, of course, English. So it is good to have a song that I think feels English, but it's not Rule Britannia either. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's not, hello, hello, what's this? So I, I think that works out well in that sense, Gerard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly like if you're at a show, like sitting at home, I think is one thing, but I could also see if you're at a show with that sort of beat coming on, you might want to stand up and get up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it reminds me a lot as well of the Prince David theme, Real Rock and Rolla. Feels like it's part of that same kind of family in terms of the sound. Um, also has the heavily modulated vocals in there too, every so often. So yeah, I get serious David vibes from this one, which uh, hey, it's another banger of a theme right there. Yeah, I mean, I haven't listened to that theme in so long. I'm going to have to go and uh, uh, listen to it again just to sort of orient myself because it never actually crossed my mind while I was listening to Haters. Right, right. Well, to me, like, this is not on my list of, like, absolute favorite themes in the roster, but it is one that a lot of people noticed when it debuted as, like, hey, this is pretty damn good. And that's Jimmy Hader. You know, she's pretty damn good herself. Um, I remember when Dynamite started, she was on a couple episodes, and then the pandemic happened, and she went away for a little bit to Rev Pro, and then she came back. And now she's signed, and I think people like her and Ruby and Serena Deeb and Thunder Rosa, like those were all very smart hires to strengthen the women's division in the company, Gerard. That's for sure. And one of my favorite things about Hater is if you watch the way that she takes like dives and planches on the floor, like when when they when they hit when they dive onto her, she like sort of jumps up a bit backwards. Oh yeah, <laughs> right on her on her back, which sort of just makes the impact from the dive look that much more devastating. You know, it's one of those little things. That's the sign of like a true professional. Yeah, we've all seen the thing where a guy will do a crossbody off the top rope and the opponent will like jump up to take it so it looks kind of cooler. She does that outside the ring, which is just gnarly as all hell. She's she's pretty cool, is that, uh, is that Jamie Hader, I think. Up next, we're going to go over to the Garrett Kidney Territory, Impact Wrestling. And uh, this is another tag team theme here. And this theme is technically New Japan, but they spent a good portion of the year in Impact which is where this theme comes from. It's Finn Juice, Juice Robinson and David Finley. And uh, they actually won the Impact Tag Titles earlier in the year. Their tag theme is by Kubrick, and it's simply called Finn Juice. I'm strutting down the street, and they don't know. So when I first heard this song when it debuted, I was like, this sounds so familiar. Where have I heard this before? And then I realized, oh, this is just the hardest button to button by the White Stripes, except not as good. <laughs> I mean, it's not the worst song in the world. I just find it to be lackluster, especially how it just doesn't really have a proper chorus. There's no sense of escalation, no part where it kicks in. It just it's on one wavelength the whole way through. There's no catchy hook either. Like, it's just a song that's there. And I feel like that's a good metaphor for Finn Juice, who at this point also just feel like they're kind of there, Gerard. Absolutely. I, I would say that this song is just there. And a good song can save a mediocre team or at least give them a good entrance. But this 
this song does not do that. And I just feel very blah about Fin Juice right now, which is funny because if you go back to 2018, I would have told you that Juice Robinson was one of the 25 best wrestlers in the world. I really thought that in 2018 with like his, some of his matches in the New Japan Cup against Tanahashi. And I think there was an intercontinental title match against Naito. But he just sort of faded away and became an afterthought. And he was already heading in that direction before the pandemic started. And the pandemic hasn't done any favors for him. Yeah, I'm of the same mindset for sure. Like I used to be big Finn Juice fans, especially Juice. Like 2017, 2018, 2019, he was my guy. But I think nowadays they've worn out their welcome, it seems, in New Japan and need to go somewhere else. And, and yeah, the, the pandemic did not help in that regard, um, especially in Japan proper where they won't go back because of quarantine rules. Um, I think the fact that you have other guys like Jeff Cobb and Great Khan stepping up to the plate in a big way, that did not help them either. Um, same with like Team Filthy on New Japan Strong or Fred Rosser or, or guys like that. So... Yeah, I mean, they just they feel like afterthoughts in a lot of ways, Gerard. Yeah, and then Finley, to his credit, he had some good performances during the pandemic, but I think he checked. He's already sort of checked out mentally, and he sort of seems to be hinting at that. Certainly. Yeah, definitely. And and back to the song here. You know, lyrically, it doesn't really offset the music all that much to me. I'm strutting down the street. They don't know, and like a title, we the V. It's time to go. I'm I'm, I'm marching to the beat. I just got paid. And I'm feeling like a chic. I just got paid. Got a pocket full of weed. The buzz. Yeah, the buzz. Yeah, they eaten for the week. Is that velvet? The brother asked me. From my pelvis, trash panda chopping. With his left hand, even got me chopping. A pulp friction. Happy beers are popping. Joey got an attitude. Debbie got an attitude. Finn Juice got an attitude. An attitude. Like, the whole thing is like, hey man, we're just a couple of guys cruising along, doing our own thing. And... It references Pulp Friction and the Left Hand of God and Trash Panda and Happy Beers and all that. And that's fine, but it just doesn't get me going, really. And I think it's that choice of making the music and melody as samey as it is, which is the problem, Gerard. Yeah, I also think the lyrics sort of describe Juice a lot more than Finley, who has like a lot more of a bland personality. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also, this is Kubrick. Uh, so it's Rocky Romero, and uh, I, I find Rocky to be pretty spotty when it comes to making themes. Like, he's done the Rapungi Vice theme and the first G.O.D. theme, which are both great. But he's also done this theme and the Good Brothers theme, too. So there's there's some hits and some misses there, I think. Well, I um, think it's the style. Maybe, like, Rocky should steer clear of, like, more, like, rock, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because those other two themes are tremendous, I thought. Yeah, Rocky is a hip hop guy first and foremost, so he's probably better off, you know, sticking to that lane. I think for sure. Um, also, I, I don't know who sings this. It's not Rocky, and I, I thought at first it was Juice, but I don't think it's him either, Gerard. So I, I don't know who it is. No, neither do I. Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Next up, we're going to Ring of Honor, and uh, who knows whether or not ROH will be back next year. We'll have to wait and see on that, but. Uh, in the last couple of years, this guy was one of their mainstays. It's Shane Taylor, leader of Shane Taylor Promotions, former TV and six-man champ as well. Taylor's new theme this year is by John Kiernan, Monster Tarver, and It Lives, It Breathes. This is called Lion in the Jungle. Rivals. 
Now this is survival. I put my hand on the Bible. You are not ready to try to. I'm a lion in the jungle. I'm a lion in the jungle. I'm a lion in the jungle. So if you're wondering, hmm, Monster Tarver, that name sounds familiar. That is NXT Season 1 legend, Nexus member, and New Japan alumnus Michael Tarver. The master of Tarver's lightning. That's the guy. He's the rapper here. And I gotta say, you know, as someone who is not the best judge of rappers, he ain't bad. Like, as far as wrestling rappers go, I think he does a good job. And him and John Kiernan have done other wrestling themes for guys like PJ Black and Fred Rosser. Uh, it Lives, It Breathes did Osprey's old theme, Elevated, so they all have experience in making wrestling themes, and I think this song overall is, is pretty good. Um, a bit repetitive with the line, I'm a lion in the jungle, being said like 90 times in the song, perhaps, sure, but still, I dig it, Gerard. Uh, this is awesome. I think, you know, it's great in terms of like fitting into like the character in the persona that Shane Taylor's developed over the past couple of years. And generally in wrestling themes, I don't mind repetition so much because really they're, the experience of watching them come out, come down to the ring is only a minute or two. So in that regard, I'm fine with that sort of level of repetition as opposed <laughs> to if I'm just listening to music on my own time. That's true, that's true, yeah. Um, well, there are quite a few Shane Taylor references in the song here. Among the typical, like, macho rapping stuff, I keep my team with me frequently, and if you sleep on me, I will put you to sleep with these hands. I'm about to mess up your plans. LeBron ain't the only one bringing the gold to the land. Uh, the land being Cleveland, where Taylor's from. You do not want it with me when I bring sons of savagery. Step in the ring and I promise a tragedy. Come from the east side of Cleveland. Nothing to something you see in. I am a problem, and this is my ring of honor. Um, there's one line I love the most, though, where it goes, None of your wrestlers are really built to me. Most of you look like you were built in Build-A-Bear. I love that because, A, who references Build-A-Bear in 2021? Honestly, like, <laughs> and, and B, he's right. No one is built like Shane Taylor. That, that guy's thighs are massive, like tree trunks. Like, I mean, not, not even lions have thighs that big, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> No, absolutely not. Like, and and sh and I think that's important. Like, because the way that Taylor's really sort of developed himself, like he's become like this really great, unique talent. And like what I was teasing earlier about, like a match that I was at for something, I saw Shane Taylor win the uh, live uh, the ROH TV title back in 2019, and in a in a four way, also that involved Hiroki Goto. Uh, and when he won, there was a actually quite a big pop from the crowd and it was like you know sort of help bring like i'm really in on shane taylor i thought his match with kenny king recently was awesome at that last roh show and so like that was like a moment for me that like sort of really you know sold me on taylor and has got me on the train and i just like am excited to see what he does after roh yeah it's funny i remember you know years ago when him and keith lee were a tag team the pretty boy killers they had a few ROH matches, and ROH signed Taylor, but Keith went to Evolve instead, and other indies, then eventually WWE. And at the time, it was like, oh man, ROH really missed out on Keith Lee, and now they're stuck with the other guy. But it's like, you know, these past few years, he's really impressed me a lot, and turned me around on him. And I think, you know, whatever happens in the future with ROH, Shane deserves to land on his feet. And I hope that he does, and... I hope the other ROH guys do too, Gerard. Absolutely. And like, you know, like you can see when wrestlers like take things seriously and start working hard and like carve out that sort of thing for themselves and just like sort of watching Shane Taylor do that because I was still watch watching a lot of a fair amount of ROH, at least I think compared to a lot of people. It's just like, like he really worked hard for it and he really got somewhere that I don't think people thought he would going back maybe even four, three, four years ago. And it was just awesome to see that development. Mm -hmm. By the way, I did want to bring up the music video for this song, which yes, there is a video for this song <laughs> and it's Michael Tarver and two other people on some rusty bridge. And the whole time Tarver is rapping and holding a baseball bat while the other two people dance behind him. And there's no Shane Taylor there's no other wrestlers. There's no clips of wrestling. It's literally just Michael Tarver on a bridge somewhere. So 
It's not the most impressive video in the world, I'd say, Gerard. <laughs> uh, honestly, I haven't seen it, but uh, your description actually makes it sound, I think, better to me than it sounds <laughs> to you, at least. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's on YouTube, so check it out there. I, I recommend it, yeah. So we talked about this earlier, Gerard. There were some down moments during the year, of course, but there were some bright spots as well. And to a lot of people, especially Joe Lanza, one of those bright spots was the return of Davey Richards to pro wrestling. Dumb jock Davey back in the saddle again, and he's been on the indies tearing it up, but he's also been part of MLW and their ever-changing world. In fact, he won the Opera Cup not too long ago. Davey's theme in MLW is by the band Enforcer of their album Diamonds. This is called Katana. So in the MLW version of this song, it has a wolf howl at the beginning, which is very important for a Davey theme. Also, I've never heard of Enforcer before. This is the only song I know by them, but this rocks. I like this one a lot. Uh, they are a Swedish metal band, and they're relatively recent too, but they sound like they're from the 80s. Like this could be a song from, I don't know, Angel Witch or Tigers of Pantang, and I don't know if Davey picked this one himself or not, but... There's a good chance he did, because in the past, Davey has used Iron Maiden for a theme song, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which again, 80s metal. He's also used Wasp and Van Halen, so it would not shock me at all if he just found this song one day and was like, yeah man, this rocks, I love it. Like, it would not shock me at all there, Gerard. <laughs> uh, no, it definitely wouldn't shock me if Davey um, chose this, which is sort of funny because uh, I do watch MLW regularly, and I never sort of picked up on this song because they don't really uh, big that big of a deal about the themes there. I don't know, you know, what the licensing and all of that is. So when I actually like sat down to listen, so I was like, "Holy shit! Like this is awesome!" And uh, I really like like I was never really big into um, metal ever, but I do like that sort of classic like '70s '80s sounds of like your Iron Maiden types. Uh, more so than other types of metal. So this really connected with me. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just love how Davey is this dumb jock wrestler. He's coming out to a song about a samurai, which, you know, warriors fighting, that all makes sense. But the lyrics... I was going to say, the, the lyrics are kind of corny. I like Google. The lyrics themselves are so poetic and erudite. A full plate armor with no man nor soul inside, corroding in the poisoned air within his shogunate. Yet, after ageless weight, fires buckled from inside by a man of arms, reaching like serpents into empires at all sides. The divine winds carries him like an arrow to its goal, unwavering, laughing but without comedy, in the face of enemies and bloody tragedy, mounted on horseback to deliver the Bushido's master stroke. Keep in mind, this is the same guy who used to come out to over and over again in ROH. Like, this might be just a little too nerdy descriptive for Davey. But but then again, then again, it's also much more believable to think that Davey doesn't care at all about the lyrics. He just cares about the metal part of it. That could very well be a two, Gerard. Oh, absolutely. He's probably attempted to Google what is a shogunate, but has been unable to properly do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is based on an epic British poem from the 1700s, so... I think cool metal riffs probably take precedence for Davey, I'm guessing there, Gerard. <laughs> oh, absolutely, for sure. 
Yeah, yeah. But um, but anyway, look, I'm glad Davey's back in the game for sure because, you know, he has his detractors for, you know, for good reason, I think, sometimes. But <laughs> but I've always been a big Davey fan, and it seems like nowadays he's taking it more seriously. He's committed to, you know, making dates and training people and just enjoying wrestling. And he's still a damn great wrestler, too. And we need guys like him on the indie scene for sure. So Davey's return, I think, is one of the brighter spots of the year, Gerard. Absolutely. Uh, I can't say that I've seen a bad Davey match since the return. In fact, I've seen some incredible ones. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Theme number eight, and we're going to go back to WWE with this one. And uh, one of their biggest, most featured characters for much of the year, for better or worse, was Alexa Bliss, the fiendess, as we called her, with her playground and her doll and her spooky magic. Oh, what fun was had by all. And Alexa got a new theme this year that she had for a few months before disappearing from TV, I guess. This is by Def Rebel featuring Sergio Veneno V12. It's called The Evil is Mine. The Evil is Mine. <laughs> Well, this sure is something. Um, it's a lot of things, actually. This this song is just a mishmash of stuff thrown in a blender. Creepy Alexa Bliss sayings, creepy staccato keyboard notes. Dun, 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 dun. Then there's dubstep, there's growly vocals over metal, there's a choir that just says evil, evil, evil. I mean, this thing is all over the place, Gerard. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty chaotic, although I think on some level, if you... If you took, like, because I think my hang up with this is just how awful the whole Alexa Bliss character was. But I think on its own, it's not as bad as when you sort of pair it with how it was actually the execution of the character, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, I get what it's going for. It's trying to not just be, like, for someone who's evil, it's also for someone who is erratic, you know, someone who will be sweet quote-unquote one moment and then evil and crazy the next so I, I get what it's going for there it's just i don't think it's a very good song to listen to just in general you know <laughs> yeah i mean like it just i think i like i probably watched more was watching more wwe at the time when she was sort of doing that character a lot more like earlier in the year and it just like the whole thing sort of like had this yeah, well, I mean, much could be said about it, but it's just like, you know, the way that it all came across to me is just like the the song was like almost like the least worst part of it, and this is how <laughs> I sort of see it. Okay, I mean, I mean, to be fair, to be fair, it is pretty creepy. Um, not because of the music or the scary vocals make you scream. I'm in your dreams, holding hands with the beast. N not that. What's creepy is hearing Alexa Bliss laugh like a schoolgirl. And say well, things Andrew, like, she's not a schoolgirl. She's fully adult, and well, you're, pro well, listen, you're problematic for even questioning that. Listen, listen. When you're saying things like, "Welcome to my playground," what do you want with evil little me? I'm gonna make you scream. It'll be fun, I promise. Now that's creepy because, <laughs> as much as people want to say that the character is not a child, she's wearing pigtails. She has a doll. She's dressed like a little girl with the overalls and skirt. She has a playground and a swing set. Like, what more evidence do you need, Gerard? It's all right there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's another thing, one of those things where it's like WWE being, you know, too obvious, you know, the classic subtlety hammer, as it were, 
but yet, you know, completely denying what is really in front of everyone's eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, regardless, she's gone now. She's off TV, which is, is so weird to me because she was so heavily featured for much of the year and, and doing like the, the craziest, wackiest, nonsensical stuff ever. Like the doll winked on camera. That happened this year. And there was also the time at Mania where she popped out of the box, sorry, the box-like structure uh, with that goop coming out of her head, which distracted the Fiend to let Randy Orton hit the RKO and win the match. Like, that happened this year, too. Like, it, it, Well, and it's then there was, there was the match with Randy Orton uh, with the uh, straddling uh, finish and, uh, I believe, uh, things falling out of the sky onto Randy Orton in that match, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and there was the fireball to Randy's face as well, which um, magically healed for the Royal Rumble, too. So, uh, yeah, just just a whole lot of fun and hijinks with Alexa Bliss, Gerard. It was it was quite the year, for sure. Certainly something memorable, uh, at least. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, uh, speaking of evil, our second-to-last theme here is for another New Japan guy. It's the Murder Machine Show. Show turned heel this year on his partner, Yo, and... Jumped to Bullet Club, where he formed the new subgroup House of Torture with Evil, Dick Togo, and Yujiro Takahashi, a group that everyone loves oh so much. And Show with the heel turn got a new theme. This is, I believe, by Hige Driver, who did his old theme, but it's not confirmed. Regardless, though, this is called 120% Voltage. <laughs> So a few years ago on the Taste of 2019 episode, we played show's face theme, 100% Voltage, and we noted how it's clearly video game music, chiptune music. Well, now we got the hill theme, and what do you know, it's evil video game music, mwahaha, dark chiptune, with a heap and helping of dubstep. Uh, the tempo is slowed down a bit, but it's all still very cacophonous and wild, and you know, Gerard, I know that everybody and their mother hates House of Torture. It's a bane on New Japan's existence. And Sho went from being this, like, cool shooter dude to cheating and make a goofy face. But I gotta say, this is still quite the banger. So, in this case, gotta take the good with the bad, I guess. Absolutely agree. I think this is a big step up from um, Sho's uh, original theme. Uh, you know, I like some sort of, like, video game tribute music here and there, but... I like sort of more epic stuff in my uh, Japanese uh, wrestling theme, so I think this really sort of gets closer to that uh, than just coming out to something that sounds like, uh, well, I guess in Sho's case, a Super Famicom. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, this is basically like the same song as the original version, same structure and melody, it's just helified. So in the beginning, you've still got the ramp up, but it's all dark and threatening tones. And instead of the three, two, one show, it's three, two, one, yeah! And again, that dubstep, which just overpowers everything. And it's not like it's a completely different song. It's just doing it in a darker tone, which I think was a necessary change because you can't really have this super bright chiptune song for a heel, especially in House of Torture, where Evil's theme is very dark and Yujiro's theme is all seedy and slimy. So... It has to match the tone of those other ones, which I think this new remix does. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like, I don't have a problem with uh, show turning heel at all. Uh, 
more like you know what he's doing as a heel but i think that this music is great and uh even if uh they uh you know put show in a in a better direction you got to keep the theme Mm -hmm. yeah i'm actually kind of surprised i was able to get this song at all because um some random person put it on youtube this is not from official sources but it's still studio quality and i'm wondering where the hell they got it from because i've been harping so much about the lack of new themes being available from new japan this year but somehow this person I guess, pack the mainframe and got this one. So, you know, knock on wood, it's a sign that, you know, more things are coming, Gerard. Yeah, hopefully. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that New Japan has sort of fallen behind on that, uh, given uh, their, they're pretty good generally with like merchandising stuff. So that the music stuff is a bit of a, a surprise that they're behind. Right, right. Well, I think New Japan did not have the best year in general, I'd say. So, well, um, they can, they can take a win on this theme at least. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah, Shibata's come back, New Japan strong. Um, this theme song, it's it's about the small victories, I think. So yeah, <laughs> and and hopefully next year they do put out more themes. I, I really do hope that for sure. Yeah, that would do a lot of uh, goodwill building, I suppose. In that case, <laughs> well, they need desperately. Yeah, for me at least. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the final theme of the episode here is one more AEW theme, and it's for the American Dragon, Brian Danielson. He left WWE behind, he left Daniel Bryan behind, and he came to AEW, and I was there, again, for the debut at All Out, and it's been just a hell of a ride ever since, just putting up great matches left and right. And Bryan's theme in AEW is by a guy named Elliot Taylor. It's called Born for Greatness. Brian's had a lot of themes in his career, but I think this is the first one specifically designed to make booties bounce. Um, I think Trap of the Valkyries is the unofficial nickname for the song, and um, I remember it all out when Brian you know, came out. This song played, and I couldn't really hear it all that well because the bass was just so prominent, just boom, boom, boom. Also, the fans going nuts, that too, but <laughs> then I heard it online afterwards, and I liked it a lot. Um, I know not everyone does, and it may not be his best theme ever, but still, Gerard, I dig this one quite a bit. Yeah, I don't think I like it as much as you, although I will say when I first heard it, I hated it. But it has slowly grown on me because, you know, Brian is on TV every week, so I've heard it quite a bit. So, you know, maybe in another six months or so, uh, I'll be a fan. Uh, I'm not going to call it bad, but it was just sort of weird and jarring to just me at first so it's taking me some time to warm up to it which i slowly am doing mm -hmm. yeah there's like three distinct parts to it there's the music which is of course flight of the valkyries his wwe music there's the chanting part you're gonna get your fucking head kicked in ba -ba 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 -ba. so you're referencing like two major facets of brian's career his wwe music and the chant from his indie run and those are two very obvious references to make and I like how they were able to, you know, blend them together and make the chant fit the rhythm of the song. That's pretty cool. Then there's the third part, which is like the pop singing. I know I was meant for this. I won't quit. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. I was born for greatness, greatness, greatness. And that is a bit incongruous with the other elements of the song and with, you know, Brian's whole persona, really, and his career. But 
it's so catchy. I don't mind it, Gerard. I actually like it. Um, again, like it's sort of like listening to it more. Yeah, I actually don't think the lyrics are so bad, and and I think the lyrics are also fine given well i guess we don't know if he's going to keep up this character a, a lot of people think that he's just going to become a face again after this brief heel run but i think in the context of the character that he was doing in his feud with hangman the lyrics actually work perfectly mm -hmm. yeah definitely that that message of you know i'm the best i'm going to be the top guy there's no stopping me like that could be you know a clear face theme for sure we've seen it a bunch of times but it could also lean into the heel side of things, too, with the arrogance and the ego. But at the same time, it's not like screaming, I'm evil, I'm a bad guy. So it could, you know, play both sides of that coin for sure, Gerard. Yeah, because I don't think a face Brian is going to be one to necessarily brag, unlike some other faces like, you know, a CM Punk or something. Right, right, for sure. And, and Elliot Taylor, I was looking him up when the song debuted, like, who is this guy? He is best friends with the Bella Twins. So that's the connection to Brian right there. And it's funny, you know, when the news started to spread that Brian was going to AEW, you know, everyone was like, oh, Final Countdown. They got to get Final Countdown for him. Well, Final Countdown costs a fuckload of money to license. Uh, I think Europe wanted like 500 grand per usage. So yeah, let's get Elliot Taylor, you know, in this spot instead. Like, I'm sure he's a lot cheaper, Gerard. <laughs> I mean, Final Countdown is cool, but I was never wedded to it as like, this is something that absolutely has to happen when it comes to AEW either. And I don't think he's he's lost anything at all by it not being there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think regardless of theme, I'm just so happy that Brian is in AEW and wrestling like the American Dragon again. like, And him just you know, being on this tear for the past four months of the year. It was so crazy just to see how easy it was for him to slip back into this role in that old Dragon style. And have those matches with Kenny and Suzuki and Eddie Kingston and Hangman and his heel promos. Like, it's all just been so tremendous. And I can't wait to see what comes next from Gerard. I'm, I'm so giddy about it. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of a better, like, four-month run. And he's going to finish very high on, like, my most outstanding wrestler of the year list. Even though he missed, what, from April to September? Almost half the year? And still comes back and just proves that he's still the best wrestler in the world. Yeah, he, he's just the best. That's all there is to say, really. He's he's incredible, really. So, All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode of Music of the Mat. Another episode in the books. Another year in the books. 2021 done and dusted. Thank you so much to everybody out there for listening to and supporting the show this year. And, and Gerard, thank you so much for being here. Your first time on the show, and it was a lot of fun. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Andrew. It was a lot of fun. Got to hear some music that I hadn't heard before. Like, if nothing else, I will be listening to a lot more Enforcer now. <laughs> that is a nice positive. Yeah, yeah. So um, any plugs you want to give, go right ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter at Gerard DiTrolio. And uh, please read my uh, All Japan coverage at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Uh, just uh, went up a review of the uh, Junior Tag League Battle of Glory one day tournament uh, that I reviewed. And I will be having a uh, probably long uh, All Japan 2021 retrospective coming up in the next uh, few days where I have many things to say uh, about what uh, the year was. And uh, you can just go to VOW for all of your All Japan coverage. All right. And Music of the Mat is, of course, part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. You can find all the great podcasts on there at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Music of the Mat. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew T. Rich. If you want to discuss this episode or the topics, you can do so at the VOW Discord. That's VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord. If you want to donate to the show... You can do that too. Just go to voicesofwrestling.com slash donate and click the big donate button beneath the name Music of the Mat. If you donate, hey, thanks so much. You're awesome. And of course, rate, review, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other places. Gerard, thank you again, and I'll see you around. Great. Thanks, Andrew. All right. For Gerard DeTrolio, I'm Andrew Rich. Thank you once again for supporting the show this year. I really do appreciate it. Happy New Year, and I'll see you all next time in 2022 on Music of the Mat. Take care, guys.
Music of the Mad is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The songs used throughout this show are property of their respective copyright holders.